spring as yeah. well. Um, so thank you everyone for being here today. Um, it is an enormous honor, um, enormous privilege to get to uh, kick off this series um, in person for the very first time. Um, and to have this incredibly illustrious and all-star panel of completely kick-ass uh, leaders um, in our midst today. We are incredibly lucky to have them visit our school. We're incredibly lucky that they are here to call, talk with us, converse with us, and have a chance to really be a part of our community long-term going forward. We're very excited to set this link up today. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce our incredible speakers today. They really are just living legends um, in our midst. Um, so um, I'd like to kick us off, I guess, in alphabetical order, uh, Dawn. Uh, Dawn Dino, who is the head of the Choosing Justice Initiative. Um, Dawn, as many of you might know in the public interest community, um, headed the Public Defender's Office in Nashville uh, for around two decades. Mm, one decade. One decade. <laughs> 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 oh, that was not a statement of anything else. You look amazing. You look gorgeous. Um, you know, so, so Dawn, Dawn headed the Public Defender's Office, um, and she set up choosing justice, I think, as a kind of epiphany that, that came to you afterwards um, in the kind of failures of our criminal justice system, where it's falling short, and the difficulties of indigent defense that uh, the Defender's Office is seeing. Um, then we have the legendary uh, Ms. Charlene Oliver, who really is a legend in Tennessee and Nashville in the country. Um, she is, um, you know, basically every accolade, TEDx talk, you name it, um, she's done it. And she is the co-founder of the Equity Alliance, which fights for uh, Black empowerment, Black political rights. Um, and she's been active um, in voting rights and criminal justice in terms of the pushing for reform um, in the community in Texas, as well as nationwide. The Biden-Harris administration is recognized as one of the people um, that have been fighting for voting rights in the country and around, um, around our community. And then we have the inimitable uh, Ms. Haynes, uh, who is with us today. She is just an absolute legend. Um, she stands before you today as a lawyer, an activist, um, someone who has been fighting for um, voting reform, criminal justice reform. And Ms. Haynes' story is remarkable. She did her LSAT in prison, I believe, right? Um, as a federal inmate. Um, and instead of doing clinic, she fought for herself uh, before the Supreme Court uh, to have a chance to reduce her sentence and to actually be recognized as someone who could join the practice of law. Um, and here she is today as a public defender, um, as someone who is a leading light in our community, and she's an author um, of her book, uh, that details her experiences from prison to practice in the legal community today. So I'd like to invite our speakers to, to have a moment, and you are on Zoom as well, so um, you know there'll be, there'll be uh, uh, other interactions as well. Uh, but to come and sort of say a few words, to talk about your experiences, talk about the challenges, and then you know I might ask you a few questions and get the audience as well to contribute. This really is a conversation, hopefully, that we can get to try and think about ways in which our school can contribute, as well as uh, think about ways in which you know the challenge that you're facing and that we can interact with going forward. Dawn, would you like to kick us off? Sure. Um, good afternoon. <clears throat> As Professor Yudoff mentioned, I was the public defender, the elected public defender at Nashville for 10 years from 2008 to 2018. Um, before that, I was an assistant public defender at the Nashville Public Defender's Office for 11 of 12 years of my career as a lawyer. And, um, you know, it's the only practice of criminal defense and public defense that I've ever knew uh, before I became the chief public defender. And during my time as the chief public defender, I had the opportunity to learn about how things work in other places besides Tennessee, which was really eye-opening for me, um, as was just leading the office here in Nashville and coming to understand some of the greater systemic uh, forces at work. When you're a line attorney as a public defender, at least in my, in my experience, I worried about my individual clients a lot and did not spend a whole lot of time thinking about the larger issues of how do we even get to this place in our criminal legal system? How, get, what are the forces that brought the people I'm representing here into this jail or here into this courtroom? Uh, I didn't think about those things. 
Uh, I think today a lot of lawyers going into the practice of public defense are way far ahead of me in that regard, and they have thought about those things, and they are bringing those perspectives and those the, the desires to change those systems in positive ways with them to practice. But that was not something I had done. So during my time as the chief public defender, what I came to understand so much more um, than I ever had before is that public defense was not set up to succeed, um, that it is part of an oppressive system that has been established, unfortunately, by lots of lawyers and judges, uh, people who, who, who are in the same profession as me. And when I became a lawyer, I was really proud to be a lawyer. Um, and I've really struggled with that over the last five, seven years of the more I pay attention to what's happening within the larger system, the more I realize how, how responsible lawyers are for the oppression that currently exists and the ways in which law is used to oppress people. Uh, and not just any, like every people or any, but certain groups of people. Right, largely African Americans uh, and people who come from socio lower socioeconomic classes. Right. Um, so I eventually decided, as that epiphany um, was that I needed to leave the public defender's office. I had been the head of it for ten years and felt like I had done what I could to make changes there to advance the cause of public defense. I think the most important thing. Um, a couple of important things that it was focused on caseloads for public defenders and reducing the number of individuals who were representing. Uh, in my experience, we said that our mission was to provide excellent representation to all of our clients, um, regardless of what they were charged with. But what we actually did was provided as good a representation as we could, given the volume of clients that we had. Um, and that's basically allowing the system to provide as little as it will to the representation of poor people. Uh, and so public defenders, I think, really have been uh, in many ways complicit with, it's, with that oppression of that system. And it is why our clients call us public pretenders and why our clients in the communities from which they come don't trust us. I think the other realization that I started to have during my last few years there was, you know, for a long time, I thought it was my clients who just didn't get me. And just like, they just didn't understand that I was a good lawyer, I went to really good law school, I really cared about the work that I did, and I was pretty good at it. They just didn't get that. And I had this epiphany that, in fact, it was me who just didn't get them and what they were experiencing. And that until I really um, woke up to that, and until I handed over that, um, power to them, I was part of the problem. So I started choosing Justice Initiative and really what I wanted to do is a 501c3 nonprofit law firm here in Nashville. And really what I wanted to do was create a place where people who needed uh, criminal representation, representation in a criminal case who couldn't afford a lawyer could go to hire somebody of their choice. Um, I mean, they can't hire somebody, right? They don't have any money. But the criminal legal system says poor people in this country don't have a right to choose who their lawyer is, whereas people with money have an absolute right to choose who their lawyer is. And I believed that the only way we would ever provide a, a service of quality representation that would be valued by the, the community we were supposed to be serving was if it was something they actually wanted. Um, and the only way you know that somebody actually wants you is if they call you up and say, hey, I would like for you to represent me or I've heard good things about you, can you help me? And the only way you get that is that if you have individuals within the community who trust you and who recommend you. So that's really this kind of niche place that I started CJI wanting to see, could we build a model where people could choose who their court appointed lawyer was and build from there? And would that improve the quality of representation? Would it improve outcomes that clients received? Um, and would it improve public confidence in the, the work that we were doing and in, in that service? And I, of course, 
I also want to do a whole, a whole lot of other things. And so it has this really broad mission of addressing wealth-based disparities in the criminal legal system here in Nashville and beyond the quality of representation that, that people can receive. Um, we also deal with issues related to bail reform. We provide um, representation to individuals in hearings, collateral hearings that they can't afford to hire counsel for and don't have a right to. So things like parole hearings, right? People with money hire lawyers to represent them at parole hearings. People without money are not entitled to a lawyer at a parole hearing. And so it's harder, once you're in the system, it's even harder to get out because you don't have money. Um, things like the sex offender registry, um, people who get stuck on the sex offender registry, they can't afford to hire lawyers to file lawsuits to say this is an unconstitutional ex post facto law. Uh, and a lot of those lawyers will require a retainer. So I wanted this big mission and I wanted freedom to do all these things. And so I started this nonprofit. And that was three and a half years ago, and we're still going strong. Um, I, on that, I'll stop and turn it over to you, Charlene. <laughs> Co-founder of the Equity Alliance. We have been in existence for about five years, a little over five years. And um, I entered into this work kind of unconventionally. Um, you know, most, most people who find themselves working in the political space or activism space, they what they've been groomed to do this, or they've been trained by their parents who were maybe civil rights activists. I didn't have any of that. I didn't grow up with political connections. I grew up with parents who were taking me down to the courthouse and seeing, um, you know, how voting is done or laws are made or anything like that. Um, but I just, I just grew up poor and having that lived experiences um, really kind of uh, drove me to understand why we need fairness, equity, and justice in this country. Um, and so as I got you know, into the working world, my entire career has been about serving people. Um, I've worked with all kinds of vulnerable populations. I've worked for the state of um, as a caseworker. I've traveled across the state enrolling folks in health insurance. I've worked with families of incarcerated uh, parents, uh, kids who, uh, whose parents are incarcerated. So I've kind of seen a gamut of people in crisis. That's kind of where I've always sort of been and worked in and served is um, just working as some, somewhat of a social worker. Um, but it wasn't until about 2012, um, I had already had a nine month old daughter and um, found out I was pregnant with my son. And um, he was born, you know, two days um, before Trayvon Martin was murdered. And um, when his murder happened, that really struck a chord in me, obviously, because now here I am with my first son and um, seeing the world from a different lens, you know. Um, I've always kind of seen the work that I do, again, from a place of, of crisis and a place of, um, you know, seeing how folks are always giving handouts in terms of charity, in terms of how we give out backpacks, you know, for school or whether it's food stamps or what have you, but really didn't take a look at, well, why is it that folks are in these situations? And so I really started to shift my perspective um, in, in my late 20s from charity to justice and really started to question a lot of well, how do people get in these situations? And um, that just kind of drove this compelling need to act. And if you remember around the time of 2012, that is what sparked the Black Lives Matter movement. And so there was this series of incidents happening across the country where Black men and boys and even women were being murdered by police um, and murdered by uh, state-sanctioned violence, even by the government. Um, if you think about the Flint water crisis um, that was going on around the time, and I was had this anger in me because I'm just sitting back watching this and questioning how is it that uh, an entire governor of Michigan 
can sit back and knowingly uh, have information that is poisoning his citizens and not give a damn because they're black. Um, because, you know, most people in this country think that black folks are disposable. And so I'm just sitting back and watching, you know, Dylan Roof kill nine people in South Carolina in the church. And it just continues to happen, this injustice on um, black folks. And this has been happening for centuries, right? Um, and so I kind of questioned at this time, I was working at Meharry uh, Medical College right down the street. And I wanted to get into the, the world of communications. I was in the nonprofit space, but really kind of in this self-discovery phase of my life and figuring out what am I good at? What, what, how do I turn all this anger? And so, you know, I just started questioning what, what do I do? What, how do I act? And didn't really have those tools available to me. I questioned whether I should go to law school. Actually, I'm still considering it, maybe. I don't know. Everyone told me not to go to law school because there's so many lawyers. So <laughs> just hire somebody. So, so y'all can come, you know, come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> um, you know, I questioned, do I run for office? Like, how do I make change? And um, so I said, let me just work on a school board campaign just to kind of get my feet wet and see what it's like to work on, work in politics. And, um, and so I worked on a Christian Bugs campaign for a school board. This was in 2016. And at the time I'm working now as the communications director for the Williamson County Chamber of Commerce. And uh, at this time, I didn't know what I didn't know, right? I was just trying to get a job in communications because that's the path that I wanted to be on. And um, they were first to hire me after 18 months search, not knowing that Williamson County is the seventh richest county in the country, richest county in Tennessee, most conservative county in Tennessee, and um, you know has the best schools, you know very affluent uh, community, and I'm exposed for the first time to a lot of wealth and a lot of power plays. Um, and I'm seeing, as if, if you all remember, Nashville at the time, 2011, 2015, is like in this boom, economic boom, still is. Nissan came here at the time, Alliance Bernstein was being recruited to come to Nashville. And um, I'm the only black person that works in this entire company of like 20 people. So you can probably imagine all the microaggressions that I experienced. And uh, that didn't help that I was already angry at the world and what's going on. But I was able to sit in rooms because I'm in middle management and um, sit in rooms with like Governor Haslam and all these CEOs who's talking about transportation and how do we fix our traffic in Middle Tennessee? How do we um, you know, sustain this growth and all this economic prosperity? How do we keep our schools great? And I'm just sitting back like, my community ain't this great. Like, I don't, like we don't have the best schools where I come from, you know? And um, just seeing how they live in this boat that doesn't, isn't reality, at least not my reality. So at the time, Christian Buzz picture comes across my computer screen at work on Facebook and it's an article saying she's running for school board. I didn't know her at all, uh, but she, was a young black woman and I wanted to help her. Um, again, I wanted to use my communication skills. And so found out she had a, we had a mutual friend, we linked up and with her, this is her first time running for public office. And she's like, I can do all that I can do. I don't know, she's putting a team together. So this is where I made my co-founder Tequila Johnson on this campaign um, because Tequila is Christian's friend. She's serving at the camp, as a campaign manager and I'm the communications director. Can, uh, Christian's the candidate. And um, there's some other folks that came along the way. And um, between the three of us, we're just figuring it out, right? And so there are a lot of things that came out of this campaign that drove me to start the Equity Alliance. And there were a few things that um, really stuck out to me. First of all, Christian at the time was about 30 years old. And you know she has political connections because of her, she has a lineage in Nashville. Her grandfather was a state representative. Her uncle was currently representative here in Love. So she had some, some access. But a lot of the old black guard told her not to run, uh, you know. And so 
that struck out to me that even though she was the most qualified, she's Vanderbilt educated, she's a, been a teacher, you know, she's done all her research, they said you're not qualified to run for school board. So that is it right with me. Um, the second thing is, you know, she was running up against a lot of money, a lot of PAC money. And at the time where I was at the chamber, I had heard this word again because the chamber was starting a business pack. And so I'm sitting back really thinking about, wow, this is how a lot of the political game is done. Because again, I'm exposed to CEOs bringing big checks, you know, and I'm just seeing how money is used to influence politics. And that was the second thing that didn't sit right with me. Um, and then the third reason was on this campaign, Christian's district, um, there's a couple of housing projects that uh, is in her district. And do you know anything about campaigns? You know, they tell you where to go knock doors. And even though there was this whole housing project with all these registered folks, the campaign consultants that we were using who were white, because most of uh, campaign consultants are white, white dominated field. Um, they were like, look, you know, we're trying to get super voters. And I'm like, what do you mean with super voters? Um, we're just trying to get the folks who we know are going to vote. So don't waste your time going to Casey Holmes project. And we just looking like, but they rest still. Why can't we, like, you know what I'm saying? So that was the third thing that kind of stuck out to me was this perpetuating belief that one, Black people don't vote. And um, we don't need to waste our time and resources on, on people who don't traditionally have a voice. So that was what um, kind of sparked the Equity Alliance movement. And um, six months, well, not even six months later, about four months later, summer of 2016, Donald Trump gets elected. So I was like, oh, hell no, we got <laughs> to do something. So excuse my language. And uh, literally about a week later, uh, even though I had to went to work with all these folks, I never voted for him um, because I'm just like, all right, we got to do something. So send a text message to these women, and that's really kind of the history of how we started. Not having any money, um, we each put in about $250 of our own money to start a bank account, and, and we met up on November 18, 2016, and my life has been different ever since. Uh, we decided actually to start two organizations that day, um, the 5163, which is the Equity Alliance, and a Power Team PAC, which is now transitioned into the National Justice League. So that's essentially what we do is we disrupt the perpetual cycle of um, voter engagement. Um, conventional wisdom says, you know, if there's 10 houses on the street, then the people that you should go talk to are the three houses of people who you know are going to faithfully go vote. Well, for us, we want to talk to the other seven because we believe that, look, if we put more people into the process, particularly people who have been shut out, put on the margins, whose uh, voices have been silenced, then we can disrupt the systemic issues and address policy um, decisions by putting people up that will care about our issues. So that is essentially what we do. We fight against voting rights, uh, fight for voting rights, and against um, one of the forms of white supremacy, which is voter suppression, and it's prevalent in Tennessee. When we started the organization, we didn't realize that Tennessee was 50th in voter turnout, and that is definitely by design. Um, they don't not, see, not only want black folks to vote, um, they also don't want like uh, brown folks, they don't want immigrants, they don't want um, low-income folks to vote, they don't want disabled people to vote, they don't want college students to vote. Essentially, if you're not a white man, then you, you are not uh, beneficial to the process. So we're here to um, make more people, I mean, excuse me, uh, advocate for more people to vote, but also to get policy plans for our communities to better the conditions of our communities. Hi, um, good afternoon. I am Cheetah Haynes, and um, you may be expecting Don Harrington, but um, I am Cheetah Haynes slash Don Harrington today. So <laughs> um, Don couldn't be here because um, one of our our youth um, people that we have been working with in one of our youth programs, um, who was actually bound over um, in the criminal legal system and charged as an adult for a homicide, actually. Um, committed suicide in the jail um, just a couple of days ago. So that's a lot of stuff that we're dealing with at Free Hearts right now. So that's one of the reasons why Don Harrington couldn't be here. Um, and I am the senior legal advisor at Free Hearts. And I have been working with Free Hearts ever since 2019. And um, 
you know, as the professor mentioned, I am a former public defender. Um, Don Diener was my supervisor when I worked at a public defender's office for six and a half years. And, um, you know, as she mentioned, yes, I have been to federal prison. Um, myself, along with 29 other people, were indicted here in the Middle District of Tennessee on various different marijuana and money laundering charges. Um, I was the only person who chose to go to trial and to hold the government to their burden to prove every single element of the case. And I was acquitted of six charges and was found guilty of aiding and abetting a conspiracy to distribute 100 to 400 kilograms of marijuana. Now, in the federal system, that carries a mandatory minimum of five years. So I was in my early 20s in college, majoring in criminal justice at Tennessee State University, and never had any exposure to the criminal legal system, but I was automatically looking at five years in federal prison. So the judge chose to sentence me to seven years in federal prison. And as your professor mentioned, um, my attorney and I, we did work on that case. We appealed my case all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, it was overturned, came back to be resentenced, and was resentenced again to the mandatory minimum at that time. So after serving almost four years in federal prison for a crime that I didn't commit, I was finally released. So I had become a statistic, but I refused to be a casualty. So I did study for the LSAT when I was in prison, and I went to National School of Law um, once I got out. Graduated, took the bar, started working at the public defender's office, and I met Don Deere, who is the, I'm not Don Deere, Don Harrington, who is the executive director of Free Hearts in 2016. And it was right after the national scene had did an article about, you know, my life and everything that I had been through entitled Beating the System. And so Don Harrington was working with the public defender's office around various different things. And so she was just adamant that she had to meet me. So we met. And, you know, I have been working with Free Hearts ever since then. Dawn um, Harrington, she created Free Hearts in 2015. And um, they have been doing, like, amazing work. So Free Hearts is an organization that is run by directly impacted women. And so the work that we do centers around supporting and education and advocacy for families that are impacted by um, the criminal legal system. And so working as a public defender, you know, I didn't feel as if my job was just to represent my clients in the courtroom. I felt that my representation went beyond that, that my representation started in the community. And so working with Free Hearts gave me the opportunity to do that. Um, and so I was able to volunteer with Free Hearts around a lot of various different programs that they had and was also able to volunteer and do some research with them around um, some of the legislation that they actually got passed um, in 2020, that was um, a primary, it was alternatives for incarceration for primary care um, parents. And so was able to do some research and help them with that. And then, um, you know, you will notice a theme of, you know, what Dawn Diener has said, what Charlene has said, you know, what I will say is that, you know, there's always this like epiphany of like, you know, I could be doing more, um, you know, or asking the question why, right? And so for me, you know, working at the public defender's office, you know, kind of like how Dawn Diener said she became, you know, got to that point. Like, I, I, I could no longer do it anymore because I, I was a systems actor, right? So it was just like, you know, we come in work with the, the best intentions, right, to dismantle the system, right? But it's really hard to dismantle a system using the master's tools. And so, you know, just really just recognizing that and recognizing that, you know, that, I, that I'm a part of this, right? Even, even though this is not what, you know, we set out to do, you know, because of the way that the system is designed, we are a part of this. And so, you know, you also start to recognize is that by your clients, by the time they get to you in the criminal legal system, there's so many other things that have gone wrong in their lives and that no one's talking about, no one's addressing. And so that was one of the reasons why I chose to leave the public defender's office in 2018 and I ran for Congress in 2020. Because, you know, when you have, you know, a client that tells you that they are, um, that they are, you know, using um, one drug to get off another drug because they don't have the health insurance to go to, you know, get for a treatment that they need, you know, that's a problem, right? 
you know, when, um, you know, you're seeing your clients who can't get jobs because of, you know, criminal records and, you know, and you're seeing, you know, the, the school to prison pipeline and how, you know, we're underfunding schools and, you know, and how this is all leading to that. And, you know, when you're seeing, you know, the, the housing taxes, you know, and people in, in communities of color, you know, are, are not able, you know, to afford, you know, housing and things. And so it's just like, you know, there's, like I said, there's so many other things that are going wrong. And I just felt that, you know, while we can address the issues in the criminal legal system, if we don't address these issues right here, then we can't ask why the recidivism rate is so high, right? Because we're not meeting the needs of people. Um, and so, you know, I chose to run for Congress and then, you know, I had a lot of people that were reaching out all across the country um, because part of, part of, you know, um, the platform was that I was someone that was directly impacted. And, um, you know, and so all kinds of directly impacted people across the country wanted to know how they could vote for me. I wasn't running for president, so they could not. But, you know, people wanted to know what they could do in their states, how they could get their voting rights back, right? Um, and so at Free Hearts, what we did was that we partnered with various different organizations in the community. Um, we partnered with, you know, several different NFL players to actually pay all fees and fines and restitution for people to be able to vote. Um, and so we were able to do that for quite a few people um, in the 2020 election. And, you know, myself and, you know, Don Harrington and, you know, several other of us that work at Free Hearts, we know that, you know, this price restoration process that it is so confusing and it is so convoluted. Um, and it's designed um, that, you know, just that, so that people will not want to go through the process to have their voting rights reinstated. So we, um, that was a, another part of Free Hearts that we created was the Free the Vote. Um, and so a lot of the work that I do at Free Hearts is centered around that, you know, um, right now in Tennessee alone, we have 450,000 people who can't vote because of the felony conviction on their record. You know, Tennessee is number three when it comes to after the number of African Americans that are disenfranchised, and we're number one when it comes to the Latinx population that's disenfranchised, right? So, you know, when we look, when we start looking at the history of voting and, you know, looking at all of the ways that, you know, black and brown people have been, you know, kept from voting, kept from being able to utilize the voices at the polls, you know, all of those things have been, you know, found unconstitutional to, you know, the being grandfathered in to, you know, the various different poll taxes, the literacy tests, everything has been held unconstitutional except for felony disenfranchisement. And right now across this country, we have over 5 million people who cannot vote because of the felony condition on their record. That is the ultimate form of voter suppression. So that is the work that, that I do at Free Hearts. And, you know, there are other things that we focus on. We have participatory defense, and we also do a lot of work there. Um, and so that is essentially shifting the power in the courtroom and giving the families who are impacted, you know, by incarceration the opportunity to be able to say that they have the power in the courtroom, right, to be able to actually know what's going on in the criminal legal system, because a lot of people don't. And to be able to use that knowledge to be able to advocate for their loved ones, you know, in conjunction and sometimes, you know, separate from what their lawyers are actually doing, um, you know, because what you heard Don Dino say about how some people in the community feel about public defenders, you know, that is true, right? And so that is something that, that you know, that we do deal with. And so we do participatory defense. Um, Free Hearts has expanded. Free Hearts um, has a base in all 95 counties in the state of Tennessee, um, which is something that, you know, we are very proud of, particularly with Charlton policy. Um, just, just this session, um, we had, we did have, we had two rights restoration bills, one that focused on jail-based voting, um, because there are so many people who are sitting in jail who have not lost their right to vote. And so, you know, but they're not, you know, able to actually vote. And so you have the de facto disenfranchisement. And so we, um, actually has had legislation to create a uh, polling location at the jail. And so, you know, we're still working on that because again, we want to make sure that everybody that has the right to vote, that they're able to vote. And then we had our rights restoration bill as well too. And um, again, like I said, Tennessee has a very, very convoluted process to get your rights restored. Tennessee is the only state that requires you to be current on your child support in order to get your voting rights reinstated. The only state in the entire country that does that. Um, and then you also have to have completed your sentence, paid any fees, fines, and, you know, paid your restitution. So, again, you know, 
this is a money thing, right? And so this is not an equitable system because you can have two people who have, you know, been charged with the same thing, who have both completed their sentences, but you have one person who is poor who can't afford to pay to participate in our democracy and one person who can. And we don't believe that you should have to pay off the state in order to participate in our democracy. And so, you know, that's, again, that's one of the things. And so we actually made progress this time around with that rights restoration legislation. Um, and actually looking forward to, you know, working with some of the Republican legislators who we actually got them to agree this time around that it needs to change here in Tennessee, that there is something wrong, right? But it was interesting how it came about because last year they didn't hear what we had to say. Um, and so last, and, and again, it was interesting um, because last year the people that we had to come testify was all black people, right? Um, and so our legislature consists of mostly white people. And so, you know, they have this, this misconception that this is something that felony disenfranchisement is something that only impacts black people. So this year we brought a white lady who hasn't been able to vote because of the conviction from when she was 17 years old. That's not even a violent offense either. And um, she came and she spoke and she talked about being a social worker and a soccer mom and all of this other kind of stuff. And when she got to the part where she said that she couldn't vote because of something that happened when she was 17 years old, all of their, they all looked up and they all started paying attention because it's just like, oh, you know, this is someone that we did not expect this, you know, to someone to be in, impacted by this, right? And so, again, you know, so there's different strategies, you know, that you have to use, um, you know, in order to be able to advance this. But like I said, you know, we, we did make progress. We're proud of the progress that we made. Um, we have fellows that are working um, each and every single day that are helping people to get their voting rights reinstated. And, um, and so we had that, we had, we just had this huge participatory defense conference in Memphis with, because um, Nashville is the main hub and then there's a Knoxville hub and then there's also a Chattanooga hub as well too. And so we're doing that along with, um, you know, some other things um, you may have seen on the news that Mindy Dodge just got released and she was um, one of the females that we had been advocating for her to be released. And so, you know, finally got her released. We are constantly in contact with the governor's office, asking him to use his commutation powers, um, you know, to um, commute sentences for, you know, people that have extreme sentences in the state of Tennessee. And so, you know, one of the reasons that Free Hearts was created is just, again, because of all of our experiences in the criminal legal system and just recognizing that, you know, black and brown people are overrepresented in the criminal legal system. And, you know, there is a difference with the needs that the women face in the criminal legal system than just the men and wanting to just give voice to that. And, um, and just really advocate for, you know, issues that are impacting women when it comes to them being involved in the criminal legal system. And so that was one of the reasons why Don Harrington decided to create Free Hearts um, in 2015. And it has, you know, just continued to grow. And we are just really, really proud, um, you know, of the work that we have been able to do over the last few years and um, always looking for more people to connect with us. Um. I'd like to open it up to questions and maybe I could, you know, get things started uh, as part of the conversation, which is just to, for you to maybe give us a lay of the land at present. Um, you know, we're seeing a new administration, obviously, at the federal level, but at the state level, it does feel like things are becoming more um, restrictive in terms of voting, uh, having a more difficult time in terms of um, gerrymandering, other restrictions that are coming in, a very tough posture at the governor's level in terms of you know, signing off on extremely restrictive measures. How are you finding your efforts here um, in terms of gaining traction towards reform? Do you see the state and the legislature currently as just a complete roadblock? Or are there some pathways that you can envision for pushing greater expansion of voting rights, improving the ability of felony former felons to get their voting right. Do you see any any hope for that or is it just, you know, uh, fighting into the void? So, yeah, what an interesting uh, state. <laughs> Tennessee, I'm not going to shoot, no, it's, it's bad. <laughs> it's, it's real bad around here. Um, yeah, we're in a supermajority trifecta with our state 
government and they abuse that power. I say they because they, they, they don't speak for me or represent my values. And um, essentially we are an economically depressed state and uh, we, they take advantage of these culture wars essentially. And we, they like to pass laws that address problems that don't exist. And, um, and so that is kind of what we're working with with our Republican state legislature. And um, when it comes to voting rights, they have uh, stopped any effort in the tracks to gain, um, to gain traction. Uh, this year, we proposed a bill to reduce um, the voter registration deadline, which it takes 30 days. You have to be registered 30 days in advance here. Um, and that is also a suppressive uh, mechanism. We uh, propose that that timeline be reduced to 15 days to shorten that, that timeline and window to process one registration forms and that got shut down. So, you know, uh, they will justify any reason why we should not expand access to the ballot. And what we're seeing is a trend of laws being passed that are being uh, adjudicated in the courts. So every law, I wouldn't say every. Most laws here are unconstitutional and they're having to be challenged in the courts. For example, um, the Equity Alliance, we championed a lot of the redistricting um, process. Um, we started with advocating and organizing for the census um, <clears throat> last year. And so we went into four different counties and made sure folks filled out that census and understood the importance of why the census is, is um, needed. But unfortunately, we uh, advocated for fair maps. Uh, we were only one of four organizations that submitted a map to the state, state legislature for Congress, state uh, rep, and state senate. And um, they claimed to have a fair process and an open process, but they waited until the day that the vote was coming to, to actually make their map public, the Republican uh, legislature. And so uh, we are not working with a government that believes in transparency, fairness, um, <laughs> democracy at all. And what they essentially did was carve up Nashville uh, three ways for the first time in 200 years. And so Nashville has had one congressperson, um, and now we will unfortunately have three. Uh, I'm in now District 7, used to be in District 5. Um, and I was able to testify for a while, all the reasons that that is wrong. Um, and if you look at the maps, they did it with such surgical precision that they ran the lines right along all the black neighborhoods. So they can't even make a case for why uh, they did it the way they did. Um, there, there's no other county in the state that uh, has three districts, we're the only one. And um, so essentially they stripped the black representation down from 30% to now uh, 8, 15, and 12%. So we have effectively no voice in Congress, not even from a Democratic standpoint, but now um, an African American standpoint. So uh, gerrymandering is alive and well. Uh, we're actually getting ready to file a federal lawsuit. Uh, so y'all first to hear that news um, <laughs> next week because of you know, the, the way the maps are drawn um, along uh, racially discriminatory uh, ways. So uh, it's, it's, it's hard and, and we're, we're having to fight again in the courts to get any type of victories. This is not our first dance of rodeo with, with the state, with the courts. We've sued the Secretary of State um, twice in one uh, victory. The first uh, time was in 2018 because they didn't like the fact that we were registering to vote black and brown folks across the state. And we were able to get uh, submit 91,000 forms in three months for the 2018 midterm. And so they tried to criminalize our efforts by making it a felony and a $10,000 fine to make mistakes on form. So we had to challenge that in federal court as well, as well as um, during COVID providing absentee back ballot access for every single scene so they can vote from home. Uh, they didn't like that too well, so uh, they challenged that in court too. So everything that we've had to come by in terms of victories has to come through the courts right now. And so I would challenge you guys as you're going from law school to we need more election lawyers. We need more of you 
I'm going into election law right now. There's only like one or two lawyers in the state that we can call on to, to look at election lawyer. We, we get our uh, representation from DC and uh, DC firms because it's just not enough. And right now we're in such a dire fight for democracy, um, if it ever existed. But right now it's definitely um, on the verge of life support because of at every turn, there are efforts to dismantle um, our voices. So. Um, I would just say that, you know, I've, I had, you know, the privilege of working with a national organization um, and focusing on um, rights restoration. And so there, there is a difference in the work that I do and the work that Charlene does, right? The work that I do is rights restoration um, for people who have been, um, you know, formally incarcerated for them to get their voting rights reinstated, right? Um, and, you know, and I think the work that, you know, Charlene, you know, she'll tell you that the work that they do is just voter suppression in general. Um, you know, which, you know, it all falls up under voter suppression, but, um, you know, I'm not an elections lawyer. <laughs> um, you know, that is, that is not the type of work that we do, even though Free Hearts um, has worked with national organizations, um, Campaign Legal Center for one, in order to sue the state, but around the rights restoration process and around the certificate of restoration. But, you know, it's interesting as we see um, voter suppression ramping up across the country, we also do see um, movements for rights restoration across the country. Um, you know, one of the things that we pointed out, um, you know, to the, the, you know, to the legislature here is that, um, you know, the Republican governor in Iowa, she issued an executive order to restore rights there. Now, of course, you know, she issued an executive order because there was really no avenue for people that have been formally incarcerated to get their rights restored. And so that was one of the reasons why she had done it there. You know, there have been Republican governors that have done it in Virginia. Virginia is an interesting state because you have one Republican governor that will issue an executive order, then another one will come back and will rescind that executive order. So that's for Virginia is, is very interesting. But, um, you know, D.C., you know, just passed a law that said that you will never lose your voting rights. So um, if you are convicted of an offense in the state, I mean, you know, in D.C., then you can still vote in prison. And, um, and so that happens in D.C. and that also happens in Puerto Rico. And you never lose your voting rights in Maine and Vermont. And so um, Biden did issue an executive order um, to make sure that people who do still have the right to vote in federal prison, that they're able to exercise their right. And um, those are conversations that I have been um, heavily involved in. We have another listening session about that tomorrow because we cannot expect the Bureau of Prisons to actually do what they're going to do. And so um, a lot of community advocates active, you know, we act as watchdogs, um, you know, to make sure that people's rights are, are not being violated in federal prison and again, making sure that people that do have the right to vote are able to vote. Um, you know, several states did pass um, rights restoration, um, you know, laws last year. Um, Connecticut was one of them that allows people to vote while they are on probation and parole now. Um, and so there are a lot of states that have actually moved in that direction that are allowing people to vote. Um, it's interesting because I see this as a democracy issue and, you know, some people will say that this is you know, this is a criminal justice issue. This is a re-entry issue. I don't care how you see it. You know, it's an issue, you know, period. And it's an issue that, you know, that we all should, you know, be talking about and that we all should be concerned about. Um, and so, you know, like I said, it's, it's just, you know, it's interesting because in some states, rights restoration is, you know, it is a very political hot button issue. Um, in some states, you know, it's not. Um, some states, you know, we're not able to move their legislation this time around because, you know, we have this whole narrative across the country with, you know, the rise in crime. And so, you know, now we need to revert back to being tough on crime now, um, you know, and so, you know, having to combat that narrative, um, you know, and saying, you know, have we not learned anything, you know, from when, you know, the country decided that they wanted to be tough on crime 20 years ago, right? Like we can't take steps back. And so it's just like, you know, we're, we're fighting, you know, one fight, but we're really fighting like so many fights like all within one um which sometimes can be exhausting but you know um you know we just continue to keep our eyes on the prize and what's important and you know just continue to do the work questions i can just speak if you can hear me yeah, yeah. for the zoom yeah. though oh, okay. <laughs> 
First of all, thank you so much for coming to speak with us. Um, this question is mostly for Ms. Diener and Ms. Haynes. Within the context of public defense work, do you think that there's opportunity to be an effective advocate within the system? And if so, how? Or would you encourage young lawyers to immediately skip that step? <laughs> <laughs> I think absolutely there's opportunities to be effective advocates. Um, I think that the systemic pressures that exist are different in different places, depending upon how the system is structured. Um, so for instance, here in Nashville, you know, the public defenders are assigned to practice in a particular courtroom what that is where there's one judge and three DAs. And so the systemic kind of pressures you start to feel when you're in that situation is, well, I have 10 clients in this court. Um, if I advocate really fiercely for this one client, is the judge going to get upset with me and be retributive to my other clients? Or is the DA, if I accuse the DA of acting unethically for this in this client's case, is that DA going to you know, stop making me any offers on my other cases. So those kinds of systemic pressures exist. And then of course, you also, you know, you come to learn what you think a judge will and won't do. And so you maybe become a less zealous advocate because you've convinced yourself that you've watched this judge deny 50 of the last bail reduction motions you have filed. And so why are you filing the one for 50, number 51? Right. You just tell your client, this is a waste of my time. And that's not good at it. Um, so I think you have to be able to resist those systemic pressures. I think to be able to do that requires a strong leader in the office where you are, um, because I believe the leader sets the culture for the office. Um, and I think that it can be really challenging. Well, it's not the thing. It is challenging to change culture. Um, and there will be pushback from within as well as from within the office, as well as from external forces. And so as a young, as a, as a graduating law school student, I absolutely encourage you to go to a public defender office that has a good leader. Um, and I would absolutely encourage you to keep your eyes open to what you see as a brand new lawyer that looks messed up to you, because it probably is. Um, and to use your voice, to call that out when you can and last as long as you can. <laughs> but I, I think it's invaluable also just to be there so that you can learn how the system works. Like, like Charlene was talking about being a, in that opportunity in Williamson County at the Chamber of Commerce, right? The things that it opens your eyes to, the, if you don't have a seat at that table, you'll never know. Um, so I think it can be invaluable to go to a public defender's office even if you understand the restrictions of the, that system. I mean, I would, you know, public defense work is good work, right? Um, and I always tell people that even though I'm not, you know, practicing, I'm in the courtroom, um, you know, I will always be a public defender at heart, right? So everything that I do, like I'm, I'm bringing that with me and I'm looking at it through that lens, right? So, um, so I would never discourage anybody from being a public defender. But what I would say is that, you know, you are going into an oppressive system, right? And so I think that it is important to recognize that and particularly understanding like who the players are in the system and understanding that particularly if you're not a black person that's in the criminal legal system, understand your privilege in, in this system, right? And, and understand that and be willing to check that and also be willing to recognize that you do have this power, but if you're wanting to come in here and if you're wanting to change the system, you're gonna to have to do something different, which means that you're going to have to be willing to give up your power in order to do so, right? And so just being honest with yourself um, within this, because it is so hard to get caught up in, you know, like Don Dieter said, you know, with the systemic pressures and everything that's going on there. And it is so hard, you know, for people to go into this and to think that, you know, that, you know, I'm doing good work, right? Um, and sometimes, um, you know, not really allowing themselves to still be accountable, um, you know, in that. And so there's a lot of, 
I think there's a lot of, you know, we have to constantly be doing self-reflection, right, when we're in this work, because I don't think that anybody goes into, you know, any type of public defense work with the intentions of doing things bad or the intentions of causing harm, right? But if you are not checking yourself, if you're not checking your privilege, if you're not understanding that you're operating in a system that is oppressive and, you know, in a system that is designed to uphold white supremacy, you know, then you will tend to cause harm, you know, in, these, in the system, not in something that you are intending to do, but it's just because of the way that the system is designed, right? One of the things that that I, you know, tell particularly public defenders that, that are not Black people is that I read this one book and it was, you know, this young white female, she was a public defender and, you know, she came into the work, wanted to do great work um, and, and she was doing great work, right? But it wasn't until like she actually stopped and she did self-reflection and she said that what she, what, what she had become was that somebody was throwing babies out the window, right? And she was catching these babies and she got really, really good at catching these babies and babies were constantly being thrown out the window. She's catching them and passing them along, catching them and passing them along. And she said not once did she ever stop and ask, who's throwing these damn babies and why? Mm -hmm. You know, and so I think that it's important that we, you know, as we are doing this work, that we are constantly mindful of the system that we are working in. We're constantly um, allowing ourselves to be held accountable and, you know, and, and, and make the necessary changes that we need to make so that we are not, you know, causing harm or perpetuating, you know, this, this system of oppression that we're in. Thank you all. That's Oh, hi, sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm curious about what your your takes on progressive prosecutors are. Um, oh, I think <laughs> I can do it. Okay, that's fine too. <laughs> well, just just because I know I think there are a lot of people here. Like I I have friends who may be going into prosecution after we graduate. Um, and I think honestly, like part of their justification for that is that they're going to a progressive office or like they intend to be progressive prosecutors. Um, and I, I have questions about that, certainly. Um, <laughs> so I think from, from the side of public defense and, um, you know, your progressive points of view, I'd love to hear what your take on that is. Like, is it even possible to have a progressive prosecutor? I'll start off with you, Keita Townsend. And I would really love to hear Charlene's position on this as well. Um, you know, is a progressive prosecutor better than a regressive prosecutor? Probably. Um, I think that uh, what I want to recommend that is that everybody read a book called Common, um, called Until We Reckon. It's written by a woman named Daniel Sered, S E R E D who is the founder of an organization in, in New York called Common Justice. It's a restorative justice intervention program for youth in well, it's the Bronx or Brooklyn. Um, but reading that book was the first and only time that I had ever thought, maybe I should go be a prosecutor. Because her entire perspective basically is that the, the criminal legal system as it exists is a complete failure that helps no one, that is rooted in racism um, and, and power and, and white supremacy and politics, right? So anything, I, I think what Kita said earlier when you, you're using the master's tools, anything that continues to just perpetuate and hold up the existing structure is problematic and it is going to fail. So uh, to say I'm a progressive prosecutor, I'm gonna come in and use this system in a positive way. There's nothing positive about the existing criminal legal system. It is entirely punitive and it hurts us. And it is designed largely as a system of social control. Give me a progressive prosecutor who says that, and you know, then maybe we can <laughs> talk about it. Um, but even progressive prosecutors are using the system um, for power. So I'll take a Larry Krasner over, you know, somebody whose policy is let's lock everybody up. But I, I'm only going to do that with an understanding of 
what Larry Krasner is really about, right? And so I think a lot of people are really of the mind, a lot of activists uh, are really of the mind that we're not going to make any progress unless we abolish the system as it exists. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, any system. I, I don't believe in progressive prosecutors. Um, Progressive and prosecutors are two words that don't even belong in the same sentence, in my opinion. There's no such thing, in my opinion, as a progressive prosecutor. Even Larry Krasner is not a progressive prosecutor. Um, again, you know, it's, I mean, like when you think of, you know, being a prosecutor and particularly, you know, this whole notion of being a progressive prosecutor, again, you are using the master's tools and you cannot use the master's tools to tear down the master's house, right? Um, it is, you know, and, and, as progressive as a prosecutor may want to be, um, they're still going to be, they're still subject you know, to outside pressure, right? Um, because for instance, let's take you know, the, the prosecutor down in, in New Orleans, right? Um, you know, you had, there were people that left the public defender's office to go work with him, you know, and advocates that were doing, you know, juvenile justice work and everything. Like, you know, he said he wasn't going to do this and wasn't going to do that. And, you know, and it sounded really good. And he got into office and he did some things, you know, and it was great. But then um, they had, you know, some, you know, young offenders to, you know, allegedly commit a murder. Um, and, a, and a murder of, you know, an older woman. And there was a lot of community outcry. And one of the things that he said that he would never do as a, as a prosecutor is that he would not bind kids over to adult court. But he did it because of all of the outside pressure, you know, that he was getting, right? And so, you know, I just don't, like I said, I don't, I do not believe in it. Um, you know, there is, there's that power structure there that I have a big, big problem with, um, you know, and then, you know, because it's already a power structure there. And then when you put progressive on top of it, it's just that I'm just a good person that has all of this power, right? But again, you know, how I said that, you know, you have to be willing to give up that power. And so I haven't met a, a progressive prosecutor anywhere that says, you know what, I have all of this power. And what I am willing to do is that I am willing to give up my power so that we can actually have an equitable system here. You know, like they're not willing to do that. It is all about power, um, you know, and, and, and that's one of the issues within the criminal legal system is the power structure within the criminal legal system because you should not have just this prosecutor that is having all of the power, essentially holding all the cards, even more than judges, what people don't even realize in this criminal legal system. And so I just, for me, it's, it's, it's a no for me. I, I mean, like it is, it is, it's a hard, fast no for me. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, I, you know, I am, uh, and, and then uh, I, if you even had someone that really wanted to do great things, right, would, would they even have the funding to do it? You know, that's another issue, right? You know, would you really even have the funding to totally abolish this system and totally to reimagine what this is, where we're actually meeting people's needs with care and not cages? You know, so there's a lot of things that go into my ideology as to why I do not believe um, in progressive prosecutors. Now, if people want to go be prosecutors, you know, by all means, um, you know, that's, you know, if you think that you can do that and, you know, and you can do good work on that end, you know, I don't want to discourage anybody, but that is just, that is my personal opinion. You can check my Twitter and every three months I will remind people there is no such thing as a progressive prosecutor. <laughs> and right now in this political climate that we have right now, I will remind people again that there is no such thing as a progressive prosecutor. And I will die on that hill. <laughs> Uh, thank you all for being here. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> um, I'm trying to phrase my question nicely, not to you, but more to the school. Um, I think the law school really likes to bring speakers like this in to have events like this that are all opt-in, learn about how messed up the, the legal system is, how the law is, but that's not what happens in our classrooms. Um, our school is full of these prosecutors, judges, the Republican legislators, like the school is full of people who are gonna fill those positions of power and they don't get exposure to any of this. 
Um, I, I just wanted to see if any of you could speak specifically to what the law school needs to do um, to try to improve things, uh, especially in our criminal law classes. It's we're just taught punitiveness. Uh, and you shared like your experience, your lived experience with mandatory minimums. Like in our sentencing class, it's kind of like a, a game of, oh, what should this person get out of an option of a term of years? And people will say like 15 years without ever having like even talked to someone who's been incarcerated or having any other options that aren't incarceration, just as an example of kind of the common discussions in our classes. So I just wanted to see if you could speak specifically to the law school and if there's any administrators in here as well. <laughs> it's a really good question. Um, I think that that has a lot to do with who a law school recruits to come to faculty um, and how they're investing in faculty, right? What kinds of compensation packages are they offering to which kinds of individuals and who are, who are they recruiting? Um, I also think that uh, supporting clinical programs is a really important thing as well. Um, I've long thought that the third year of law school was a useless waste of time and a great money-making opportunity for law schools. Um, and I believed that the third year, if you're going to have a third year, that it should be practicum, just like, you know, a residency for a doctor. It should be practicum and it should be required that it not be in a for-profit setting, right? That it be in real world settings, working with real people who need legal services. Uh, but how do you convince the capitalistic private law schools to engage in that? I don't know the answer to that, right? I mean, I think that, that again, when we talk about systems, this system is rooted in uh, white supremacy and racism. It's also rooted in capitalism. And those two things are intertwined and have been since the founding of this country. Um, and that's why money is so important. So those are my lame suggestions. My yeah, last one of the observation um, is women's history month. It's still women's history month. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, women's history month, and you have a panel of women. And the men of law school is probably one of the most well funded uh, departments here. And we're doing this on our own time for free. And I just wanted to call it out. That is not equity. And so I just want to challenge you guys to consider that. As people who are on the ground, I consider myself a practitioner. I don't operate in theory. I operate on what actually happens in the real world. And we are tired. We are exhausted. We are doing the ugly work that no one else wants to do. And we are often doing it without compensation. And so that needs to be more valued. Um, we value in this capitalistic society professions that, um, again, don't get to justice equity <laughs> and um, undervalue the roles that actually do that. So just wanted to make that. Yeah, that's, that's good. Also, too, I would say that um, the fact that you've asked this question, you've recognized you know, where there's a gap there. Um, and, you know, sometimes you have to send along, right? Sometimes you have to advocate, you know what I'm saying, to have some people come in that's going to bring a perspective. So, you know, use your voice, you know, to do that. So, you know, go and talk to your professors and be like, hey, you know, like, I appreciate, you know, like what you told us, but, you know, like I've heard, you know, that there are some other people in the community, there's some other organizations, you know, that's doing this work and maybe we can get a real life perspective of what this actually is, right? Instead of just, you know, a calculation of what this is in the book, right? Because, you know, yeah, you know, when, it, when we're talking about sentencing, when we're talking about sentencing guidelines, you know, whether it's, in, you know, a, a state scheme or whether it's, you know, the federal scheme, right? You know, when we're talking about, you know, crime and punishment, you know, I think it's important that we put faces with that, right? Because it's one thing to read about it in a book, but it comes from real, you know, when you actually see 
you know, what the impact of that is, right? Because you can have a class and you can say, you know, um, Mr. X committed this offense and these are the guidelines for Mr. X. Like, what sentence should Mr. X get? You know, well, according to Mr. X's, you know, the offense that he committed, according to, you know, his past criminal history, you know, this and the other, Mr. X should get X amount of time, you know what I'm saying, you know, in, in prison and jail. But until you bring in Mr. X and Mr. X tells you, Again, that why, because we don't talk about that why. We don't talk about why people do the things that they do, right? You know, because when we do talk about that, then we uncover, you know, all of, you know what I'm saying, these issues within every single system, not within just the criminal legal system, but within every single system, right? And we see that, you know, that a lot of these things that's bringing people into the criminal legal system, like they're codified, right? You know, and so it opens your mind up to so much more than Mr. X committed this offense, his background is this, how much time should Mr. X get, right? You know, it makes it a reality. It puts a face, it puts a name, you know, to Mr. X, right? And so then you say, well, you know what? Mr. X was raised in poverty. Mr. X saw his dad commit suicide. Mr. X's mom has three other kids in addition to him, and she's working three jobs just to put food on their tables, right? So that leaves Mr. X to be able to be, you know, the the, the caregiver for his three young siblings, right? You know, um, Mr. X can't even pay attention in school because he is trying to provide for his younger siblings, which he should not be doing, but that's what he's having to do because Mr. X's mom is working three jobs to provide for them, right? So you start to get a full picture you know, of, of who Mr. X is. And you're just like, oh, well, okay, well, maybe it says that he should have this, but because of all of these other things, maybe maybe if we met these needs with Mr. X, then we wouldn't even have a Mr. X in the criminal legal system. And so I think that, you know, it's important to see that. Um, and it's important to see things in, in a perspective other than, you know, this punitive perspective, right? Because that's what the criminal legal system is. That's what it is. That's what it's designed for. And so we've got to start thinking differently. But if we don't see differently, then we're not going to think differently. One quick question. Hi, thank you so much for coming. This is uh, very insightful. Really quickly, um, kind of on the theme of isolation that you all have all touched on, how isolated is working key, and even in the context of law school, how perhaps some of um, these conversations can be isolating as well. Um, so I'm wondering if you have found kind of people along the way uh, who have been willing to be allies to you, who otherwise you might think of as very right and file. Um, if not, uh, is it your belief? I'm just curious how you approach the work. Is it your belief that you know really this is work that you've committed to doing in a silo, um, or do you find it a good use of your energy to kind of always keep the door open for people who um, you know might have a revelation and and want to be supportive of work? This is more a question of just you know how you, what you find to be a really good use of your energy as you're pursuing work that's really difficult. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I will say that, you know, the, the work that we do, you know, yes, um, you know, allyship is great, right? But we're looking for co-conspirators. You know, we're looking for people that's gonna walk arms with us. Um, you know, and and that takes a lot, right? That doesn't take, you know, just reading one or two books. Um, in order to be able to do that, to understand what the issues really are, um, and to make sure that you're not bringing harm, um, you know, into these spaces, right? And so, um, you know, the people that we like to work with, we make sure that it is people that understand that. It is people that um, that's willing to give up their power. Um, people that's willing to listen to Black women, and particularly Black directly impacted women. Um, particularly when it comes to the work we're doing because it's centered around, you know, criminal justice reform, right? And so those are the types of people that we're looking for. Um, you know, yes, people do have epiphanies, right? You know, like, you know, because we're all changing and, you know, we're all evolving and that's what it's about, right? You know, my thought process from 10 years ago was not the same that it is now. And so I think we have, do have to give space for people to grow and to learn. We have to give people the grace to do so because we want that same grace extended to us. But, um, also, too, 
you know, we have to protect our people in the process, right? Because I'm not going to let you come into this space and you're going to do harm here. Um, you know, let's, you know, let's look at some things. Let's talk about some things. Let's make sure that, you know, that you're really rooted and grounded in, in some things and that you're rooted and grounded in this work. Um, and then, you know, we can bring you in because one of the things that we don't want to do is that we, we are very careful with making sure that our work is not co-opted, right? Because you will have people that will say that they want to help and they will take your ideas and, you know, and then they're going to, you know, make them their own, um, you know, or they will want to tokenize, you know, certain, you know, Black people in these spaces, right? And so um, in, in welcoming, um, you know, people in um, that may not have these lived experiences, we are very mindful that, yes, we will welcome you in, but we're going to protect our people first. You know, I think one observation I have is how incredibly courageous um, and hopeful you are and how you find the strength to keep that hope going is something which is incredibly inspirational. Um, I think a lot of us would have given up where you have kept going um, and standing up not just for yourself, but for other people. Um, and that takes just enormous amounts of grace and inner, um, inner power that you have as individuals, as people, as well as obviously professionals in this space. So. I think we have learned a lot. Um, at least I've been enriched both from the ideas that you have brought, but also from you as people. Um, and the kind of energy that you have is something that is incredibly inspiring and humbling for all of us to, to have and to learn from. So thank you so much for being here with us today, uh, for teaching us, for giving us the opportunity to learn from you. Um, so thank you so much for making that time with us today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank <laughs> you.